I'm going to be talking about a project that uh, Northlight Heritage is, is the um, leading, lead partner on called Digging In. Um, it's involving various communities, communities of interest, um, and as you'll hear as I go along. So, um, yeah, just to kick off, I'll give you some background to the project. It came about, just to orientate you, you are about there, where the top hour is, and Digging In is in Pollock Country Park, some of you might know. It's one of the biggest parks in Glasgow, um, if not the, the biggest, that's it shown on the bottom, and there is Digging In on the bottom right, now on Google Earth. Um, uh, so, it, in a nutshell, it reconstructed First World War trenches, and I'll get into why we're doing that and what, what it's all about in due course. Um, but first of all, just a little bit of background how it came about. Um, Derek Alexander, who is an archaeologist for the National Trust for Scotland, was the one who planted the little seed in, um, in my ear initially, uh, several years ago now. Um, and to cut a long story short, I spoke to Professor Tony Pollard at the University of Glasgow. And we worked together on, on First World War things over the years, um, excavated on the Western Front and so on. And Tony's done quite a lot of work um, there. So we knocked the idea around, thought it sounded kind of crazy at first, but it seemed to grow legs. Um, we went uh, on a kind of metaphorical journey all around the country trying to find a suitable site. Um, Edinburgh, a school playing field in Edinburgh, a forest and fight for country park in Stirlingshire. Um, and then finally, uh, we got lucky and ended up here in Pollock Park, and that was for a, a contact of ours, Lorna Innes, who was at that time working with Glasgow City Council. She put the idea to them. Um, Pollock Park, if any of you know it, it's a former design landscape. It was the design, the design landscape for Pollock House, um, a medieval estate, which kind of was a, um, became the seat of the Maxwell, the Sterling Maxwell family. Uh, it gets 1.4 million visitors a year. It's home to um, this Pollock House, as you can see, a, a National Trust for Scotland property, um, the Borough Collection. <coughs> excuse me, the Borough Collection there on the top right. Um, kind of world famous um, art gallery. Um, so it was a really, for us, a really plumb site for to, to position the trenches. Um, the council was quite skeptical initially. In fact, I had a meeting the other day with um, our kind of initial contact there, and he was saying, first he was like, who are these crazy people who want to come and dig holes in our park? But um, he came around and he really became a champion for it, and so that's how it, it happened. Um, and in fact, it's not as crazy as it might seem because Pollock House has its own First World War links. Um, there's a plaque just along the wall in the, in the slide. If you walk along a bit to the right, there's a plaque showing the names of all the people from the estate who served in the war, including those who came back alive. Um, uh, John Sterling Maxwell's, one of his sons was killed in the war quite early on. His daughter Anne was breeding mice during the war at the house for um, use on submarines to detect uh, gas and to get to detect uh, gas leaks and so on. Um, and <coughs> John Sterling Maxwell himself was instrumental in setting up the Forestry Commission, Commission really in response to all the leveling of so many forests to uh, supply the trenches and so on. So it's not quite as... <coughs> <laughs> we will shortly be commencing the dignifier test. No action is required. I repeat, no action is required. Pretty move. <laughs> I'll try to keep talking in one second. And the house was also used as a hospital convalescence home for, for soldiers um, during the war. But why indeed um, that Pete Miller's at the council, his, uh, his thought that we were crazy might have not seemed um, so off the wall at first. Well, as you can observe in the, the sh another, another shot there from Google Earth, it's um, quite a distance from Glasgow to the Western Front. Um, not to mention to the other theaters of war in North Africa, the Middle East, and um, Russia, the Balkans, and so on. Um, that distance is exactly why we wanted to do this. So the Western Front's a long, long trip for particularly school children, some of whom get the chance to visit it and to kind of learn more about the experiences of people on the ground. But it's a, quite expensive, so we're talking several hundred pounds, and most kids simply won't be able to afford that. So we wanted a way to kind of bring um, information about the, the people's experiences um, during the war to audiences here. It's also a long distance conceptually. A hundred years ago, 
um, very hard for younger people especially to relate to that now. And why should they? Why does it matter? Some people would argue it doesn't. Well, why I think it is important to bring aspects of that history into the present um, and understand that relevance to today, and I think we've been hearing about it already this morning, um, the talk by Monique and Norma about how um, influences and experiences during the war are still resonating today, and they still are worth talking about and addressing and interrogating and bringing into our um, wider narrative. Um, so what I should say what digging in is not, it's not military history, it's not about who fought when and what day and who won and what strategies were used and so on. There's plenty of that out there. Um, it doesn't particularly interest me and um, it's not, the digging in isn't really for um, military history class, although they might enjoy coming. Um, what it is is about that human experience. So the First World War, as we know, it touched almost every aspect of life um, from communities, the shape of communities, from the experiences, the makeup of families, from women's rights and women's experiences in the workplace, to medical innovations, to we go on and on and on. Um, so there's lots and lots to mine here in terms of uh, understanding that. What we're also not trying to do is recreate the Western Front in any, in any sense. That, of course, would be um, in very poor taste. It's really about kind of creating an environment that uh, facilitates people's sort of imaginative engagement with those historical realities um, and widening their kind of uh, intellectual horizons um, in that way. Um, and it helps us understand our society today because we know it, it influenced so much of Attention please, attention please. Fire has been reported in the building. Please leave the building. So, I think we're not supposed to move. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a fairly polite, um, calm uh, fire alarm. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's intended to kind of open windows on how um, people responded to the extreme situations they were put in, um, in, in all kinds of ways, and and how those um, responses, good and bad, are still resonating today. So it's shaped, you know, our, our world in geopolitical terms, for example. That that concludes the pilot test for this week. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, <laughs> so I'm going to quickly rattle through uh, a bunch of time um, what we've actually done at the site and what we're doing in terms of delivering content, creating content around that. Um, speak up a bit. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> so I should say, um, it, Digging In is it's run by partnership, it's organized by partnership, led by North Light Heritage and involving the University of Glasgow, Glasgow City Council, Stuart's Melville College, and um, um, that's it, sorry. <laughs> Funding is from the Heritage Lottery Fund and the Covenant Fund and the Robertson Trust. That's the credits. Um, the way that North Light are kind of delivering it broadly with input from all the other partners. So it's based around trench reconstructions, which are both experimental and educational. So part of them, as you can see on the bottom right, um, nice shiny wood, all safely tied in the back with steel cables, uh, very very well engineered. But that's all based on um, actual plans for trenches, which were issued to troops in the field during the First World War, not the super uh, Rolls Royce health and safety. Um, provisions which we had to put in to make it safe for people to get into the trenches. That's all hidden now um, and they look pretty mucky. And um, So that that was a kind of research into those field manuals translated into engineered designs and then safely constructed on the ground by contractors. But we also have an element that's experimental. So we have um, work parties uh, coming in and digging trenches by hand, shoring them by hand, seeing how fast they fall down what you have to do to repair them, 
So there's that strong experimental aspect as well. And that evolved a lot of research into just looking at photographs and, and how, because of, of course, the field manuals were issued and they're very prescriptive, but um, on the ground soldiers used what they had and adapted to conditions that they, that they encountered. Um, and we use those trench reconstructions as a kind of hub for exploring all these different experiences during the war. Um, through open days, uh, school visits, and digital content. And in a minute, I'll kind of run through the <coughs> flavor of, of some of the stories that we're trying to tell. Um, but volunteering is a really strong component of the project, and we couldn't be doing with, couldn't do it without it, really. Um, we're working with uh, Scots in the Great War, a living history um, group who come and occupy the trenches in character, uh, and they're really great at kind of conveying some of those daily experiences to, to visitors. Um, so those are on the left, that's Jude being an Edwardian housewife and uh, all, her, all her gear and some of the, the guys in the trenches there. Um, we also have volunteers just come and, and join who want to be part of the project and want to um, get involved in interpreting that heritage for, for visitors and especially for school children. So we work with a lot of university students who do internships with us and they work with um, Lindsay uh, develop, uh, delivering school visits. Um, we've had about, I think, 5,000 school children through the gates so far, um, and, and more than that in terms of visitors to open days. Uh, we also have a strong um, component working with veterans, engaging veterans in the project as a way of uh, kind of facilitating their integration into civilian communities. Because they can be very isolated, uh, they come back from um, service and they have all sorts of issues and um, can find it hard to sort of get on with life in an environment they're not they're not familiar with anymore and in, in around in community they're not familiar with and where they don't feel part of so the goal is to sort of get them involved in something working as part of teams um, in some cases putting in their knowledge of for example field fortifications how to build a sandbag um, parapet and uh, also getting them all involved in gardening creating trench gardens which I'll come to in a minute. So um, just to give you a flavor of how you go about, how we are going about trying to um, get people to engage imaginatively with the historical realities of the First World War. Uh, as I said, Lindsay runs a very successful learning program for schools. Um, there she is um, with some, uh, some kids trying out her uh, hard tech. They all seem to like having a munch on it. Um, we run, so we run open days on particular themes, for example, um, technology. So here the, on the top right, the Scots in the Great War are, are simulating a gas attack and how troops would have reacted that, to that, and the sort of uh, the noise and the confusion and everything that would have, um, would have prevailed. Um, technology is also looking at how weapons <coughs> developed to be more deadly during the war, but also how technology developed to preserve life. So for example, listening technology, going underground, listening to the enemy's movements um, to try to, to prevent casualties and also inflict them, of course. Um, we, technology open day, we have a replica grenade launcher and um, visitors can fire up tennis balls and launch them across no man's land to give a sense of the, um, the kind of reach of these weapons. So I should have said we have a German trench and a British trench so we can talk about the two sides. <coughs> Uh, we've got children there, I think they're painting um, helmets to, in a camouflage way, so it's getting across the technology of, of um, a painting and dazzle paint and so on. And we talk a lot about just everyday life in the trenches, so how soldiers um, kept themselves clean, how they coped um, socially with being cooped up with their comrades in those conditions, uh, how long they actually spent there, what, was, what diseases they encountered. Um, how wounds were treated and so on. Um, medicine is another thing we've looked at in different open days and during school visits. Um, so lots of the treatments that we take for granted today had origins in the First World War. So look, looking for example at how to um, set a broken bone, particularly a leg. Uh, at the start of the war, hundreds of thousands of soldiers died because of the rubber being there breaks the broken bones weren't being set properly, a lot of blood loss. And by the end of the war, that I think 80%, started 80% at the start with, with broken femurs, died, and by the end, 80% were surviving. 
Um, this is something we really take for granted today. Uh, things like x-ray, developed by Marie Curie, going around with her little ambulances and um, x-raying um, soldiers on the front line so that they could be operated on quickly. Um, plastic surgery to um, try to help people leave, live some kind of normal life after the war, after horrific injuries. All that kind of thing had its origins in medics trying to cope with all the, the damage that was inflicted to the human body during the war. Um, and then there's, of course, the mental health issues. So how did soldiers cope? How didn't they cope? And what were some of their strategies? So trench gardens, um, that's the picture on the bottom left of a, a series of gardens um, behind the French lines, I think. Uh, and this is a, a kind of coping strategy. Where soldiers would just create these little gardens, sometimes right behind the line, sometimes farther back, as a way of sort of creating some order, and beauty, and growth in the midst of all this uh, destruction and chaos. Um, and as a, as a kind of support for their mental health. And we've come across stories of soldiers going rooting around the gardens of chateaus and um, writing home asking for seeds. And this is a really important way of um, kind of keeping in touch with their humanity in a situation that is draining it, trying to drain it all the time. Um, so <coughs> recreating these trench gardens and getting people involved in, in maintaining them at the trenches. Animals, the, the impact on animals, which was enormous. Um, we had an open day, a couple of open days on that in, uh, at the end of August. And also their role in supporting people's mental health as pets and mascots and the relationship bond between horses, dogs, and people, for example. Um, so medicine, yeah, I'm coming back to that. Uh, so one, one of the ways we try to get that across to school kids is get them involved in a kind of triage role play. So they're, um, they have to take the part of medics and wounded, and the wounded have particular injuries, but they have to, um, the, the medics have to decide in what order they're gonna be treated, who's gonna be patched up and sent back to the front line, who's gonna be, uh, who needs operated on straight away, who's gotta go back to base hospital. Um, and that always kind of opens up some interesting fault lines of the classroom. They quite enjoy sending their, their teachers for a double dose of morphine to be uh, sent off this earth. Um, but uh, it's, it's trying to get them, putting them in the shoes of medics who were put in that situation on the front line and getting them to understand the kind of situations and the ethical considerations that frame those processes. Um, and then just quickly looking at stories of um, particular communities. We've got um, miners there who were brought out in great numbers from Britain to um, carried the underground war, digging tunnels and saps and so on, and all the kind of experiences they carried with them um, and the effects on the communities they left behind. Um, looking at those relationships between the two lines, so the, the, the hostility that was kind of stirred up by um, officers often because it was part of getting soldiers to do their jobs by uh, making them see the, the, the other side as the enemy who was there to be killed but actually the kind of instinct for connection and relationship that often arose in spite of all that between the two sides, often particularly quiet sectors. Um, we'll be looking at that on, in December, an uh, open day on um, fraternization and truces and looking at the historical realities behind that. And stories of trying to draw out some of the, the things that um, Monique and Norma were talking about this morning, but really only touching on this is something we definitely want to kind of delve into more, looking at the experiences of um, other groups, for example, African Americans, um, who came over in, um, as the US joined the war towards the end. And uh, we looked at this in an open day in September, and their experiences, they came over and segregation was enforced, so they weren't allowed to fight alongside American white soldiers. They were put alongside the French um, army who thought they were terrific and, uh, and earned a reputation for you know, great courage and, and ferocity on the battlefield. And they also were instrumental in introducing jazz to Europe. The first time a lot of European audiences heard jazz. Um, so it's another kind of angle to explore there. Um, and looking at the home front experience, more all the industry, particularly here in Glasgow, uh, munitions, steel production, um, ships, of course, on a huge scale, and all the social history behind that. Who was making this stuff? Uh, women in a lot of cases, um, or men in protected occupations who weren't allowed to conscript to, to enlist. 
Uh, and what was the effect on communities with that? Well, we know it opened a kind of can of worms, if you like, for um, how women were perceived, how they perceived themselves, <coughs> what kind of work they could do, what rights they should have in terms of voting, and okay, it took a while for suffrage to actually come into effect, but once that can of worms was open, the worms didn't go back in. Um, and the role of pe peace protests and conscientious objectors. Glasgow itself, the home of the biggest pe peace protests during the war, right here in Glasgow Green, just down the street. Uh, 5,000 people, I think, just after the, the few weeks after the war broke out. Um, rent strikes protesting against uh, landlords raising rents, exploiting the, the absence of men. Um, the whole Red Clyde side labor movement. There's lots and lots of stories to tell there. And just looking more closely at some of the stories of women who, um, uh, as I said, were taking all kinds of jobs in forestry, shipbuilding, um, and the impact on, um, on the families when, they, when their, their husbands, brothers, sons didn't come home or did come home completely changed and how they coped. Um, and they're down at the bottom left. That's just a, a, an event we did with the National Theatre of Scotland who came in um, doing a kind of engagement event to highlight the, uh, the women in the stories of the 306 British men who were shot for cowardice um, and it's linked to their production, 306 Day. So that's um, really a gallop through some of, the, some of the things that we're trying to explore through Digging In. Um, there's lots more. We have a, a, a website which hosts various digital content and input by interns and volunteers and um, various people. We've got a history pin project which we'll be launching shortly. We'll be inviting participation as widely as possible. Um, and if anybody's around on Sunday would like to come out to the trenches, we're open from 12 to 4 for a remembrance event. And we also have lots of volunteering opportunities. So if anybody's interested in getting involved in anything from researching, writing for the website, working with schools, um, helping out at open days, please get in touch. We've got flyers out on the North Light Heritage table and we'll be really glad to hear from you. Thank you.